All right, so we're gonna get started with XCPNG Server. Now this is a version of Zen Server. And just for a little quick clarification, so Zen Server is the open source project with the Zen hypervisor. XCPNG is a distribution of that run by the XCPNG team versus Citrix, which I've talked about before on this channel, is the other version of Zen. Now, good news is they're completely compatible, and for the most part, even all the commands are all the same. So if you're ever searching, you can also add the word Citrix Zen Server, and as of version 7.4, because they're so similar, most all the commands are interchangeable. Actually, I'm not even sure which exceptions I could make at all of which ones aren't interchangeable. The one thing that's not interchangeable is with XCPNG, it's all open source, versus to get some of these high-end features like the uh, Zen Motion and other high-end features, Citrix licenses all of that. Even though it's something that's part of the open source project, when you get Citrix's version of it, it's licensed versus XCPNG, it's full featured. So we're gonna start with that one. And in case you're someone who followed my channel before and, and loaded Citrix Zen Server, don't worry, you can just load XCPNG over the top of it and it will bring in all the same files because the structure is the same. They have an upgrade path. And yes, I did call it an upgrade, even though you can go from same version to same version and eliminate all the Citrix side of it. Now, the XCPNG Center that we're gonna talk about later, that is only compatible with XCPNG and it does pull from the Citrix. The Citrix one will not work with XCPNG. So you're gonna to have to get a new Zen server, Zen Center link for download. Now, as far as I know, it will work backwards with the Citrix one, but you can't use the Citrix one with this, but we'll cover that later. It's pretty straightforward. The good news is if you have Zen Orchestra, if you're used to using that, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Zen Orchestra is also compatible with both. And you can actually have a mix of servers. You can have some Citrix and you can have those and they will work fine with Zen Orchestra. I do, I do recommend though going all the way to XCPNG. Now I started with a really basic motherboard here. I had a pole, this is actually an old i7-870, uh, 16 gigs of RAM and a basic graphics card because it doesn't have onboard. I wanted to start with something really basic that you might have laying around, older motherboard that will work with this. Important requirement though, is that you have a processor, whether it's AMD or Intel, that supports virtualization. So you have to have the virtualization extensions in the processor, which a lot of modern processors, even this older one here, do have. It's been around for quite a while. Now, would I recommend this for a setup? No, but if you're building a home lab, this will get, the, get you started and you can start playing with it. Anything you produce here, the uh, systems, the, the virtual machines that you create, you can easily transfer them over to a higher end machine. So it's kind of the fun thing if you get started here, but buy another server later, when you buy the other server, you can use the Zen Motion just to pass them over. Now, I done a video just on Zen Motion to show how easy it is. And once again, I'll remind you, if you start out with an AMD machine and you move to an Intel machine, you won't be able to pass those VMs over live, but you can still pass them over in a shutdown state. So any of the, the learning you do on something basic where you get started will still apply to uh, moving it or your knowledge base of getting it set up on another machine. Now, the other machine as well, if you do something like an R710, you're gonna have a RAID array on that maybe. That's perfectly fine to use. This is not like FreeNAS where it has built-in RAID systems. You have to configure, if you wanted to have multiple hard drives on this, you would have to configure the RAID array in Linux. It's based on CentOS, both the Citrix and XCPNG versions, and you can use the commands to build your own RAID and storage arrays and manually do that. It's not something native to the system. But a lot of things, Everything else besides that is the same as uh, on this board as it's gonna be on like a Dell R710 or any other commercial enterprise system that you may want, you know, HP ProLiance servers, Lenovo servers, whichever server you wanna load it on. For compatibility, they are not gonna specifically list every random motherboard. They just don't have the time for compatibility testing. But if you do look up compatibility, they do have certified Zen servers that you can Google. And those are ones that are like known and tested. We've actually tried Zen server on a variety of systems and I haven't found really anything it doesn't work with as long as it's supported in CentOS. So let's go ahead and get started. Have my USB with XCPNG on there, have a motherboard set to boot from USB, single hard drive, happen to have a old uh, 300 gig Raptor drive laying around. We've got 16 gigs of RAM uh, for this, and like I said, a video card. Got my pocket knife, 
because I don't have a power button. So this is my pocket knife power button. Now the coffee's optional, but it's early in the morning, so I'm gonna have coffee while we're doing this. So go ahead and stab it. Oh, I should probably turn the power supply on. All right, and you stab the power button. <clears throat> and we get to watch it come to life right here. The installer is really straightforward. So the first screen says to install or upgrade, press center key. If it finds a previous version of Citrix Send Server or even XTPNG, it will upgrade over the top of it. Let's go ahead and press enter and start going on it. Select your keyboard layout. It does allow some options for special storage classes or advanced driver setup. We're just gonna hit OK, we don't have any of that. Accept the end user license agreement. It's gonna find all the hard drives. Now, what it will do is span hard drives. It uses LVM, and if you had multiple hard drives, you can span them. That's not the same as rating, just so you know. Uh, it just will share the storage pool across all the hard drives you have plugged in. So if you're using a system that already has a predefined RAID array, it will select that and that will take care of your RAID. If not, as I talked, you, there's other ways you can do this by setting up the RAID in Linux and then adding the storage pool. That's gonna go outside the scope of this talk. Now I'm gonna tab over here, enable thin provisioning optimized for desktop virtualization. On LVM arrays, you can do thin provisioning and you can go ahead and Google real quick what that's about, but in short, it you can say I have a 100 gig drive, it will allow me to allocate 100 gigs to it, but if it's only using 25 gigs, it only uses 25 gigs on the drive, allowing me to allocate more to there, hence thin provisioning. You also notice that the SDB is the other device in here, that's what we're installing it from, and we don't wanna install this on a thumb drive. You can, I believe it is possible, but if you set this up on a partition, it's only gonna use a small piece for what they refer to as DOM zero for the 300 gig drive. So a small portion will be dedicated to the operating system, the rest will be allocated towards Zen server storage. We'll live dangerously and skip verification of the media. We get to set our password here. We're gonna go ahead and go with automatic via DHCP, but this is where you can set a static IP. Obviously, I highly recommend a static IP depending on your network environment or making sure you know what the assignments are for it. It also supports if you wanted to tie it to a VLAN that is supported on here. Now, please note, there's only one network interface on this, and that's an important aspect of this, that there's only one network, because we're gonna cover how the networking works with only one network card. So I'm assuming this is a getting started video and you only have certain limitations. If you buy some commercial enterprise boxes, you'll find they have a whole array of network. We'll go ahead and call this, we'll rename it XCPNG YouTube. And I'm just tabbing through these. It also, you can hit D and we'll choose Detroit. Yes, just use normal NP. And then finally, the install. The install goes relatively fast. All right, unless you have any supplemental packs, uh, then just say no. Completing installation. And now it's complete, hit okay. Now we have the boot screen. I still have a little bit of coffee left. Didn't take too long to install. I fast forwarded parts of that because, well, no one really wants to watch the bar go across. Now I will comment the error you see right here, unable to init device MC log. I've seen that on a few of the systems we've tested it with. It doesn't seem to have any problems when I see that. It just does that. Um, I, Like I said, I have not really dug into it, but it hasn't caused me any issues. And I've seen it even on some of the enterprise machines, but it's not absolutely consistent. Uh, that or it just passes by so fast, I don't always notice it. All right, so now we're at the management console and you can look and see what IP address it had. Um, the networking settings, authentication, 
virtual machines that are running is pretty basic. And this allows you to log in and we're gonna log in from here. Cause I mean, you can manage this from the command line, just so you know. If this is what you wanted to do and do everything command line driven and type in UUIDs and everything else, that is completely possible. It's complicated. It goes way beyond the scope of getting started. It's way easier to use either Zen Orchestra or the XCPNG Center. We're gonna start with the XCPNG Center because it's you know pretty easy to get going and set up. So we see the IP address is 192.168.3.77. So we're gonna go in my office and jump on it from there and show you how to get moving. Now I'll leave a link where you can get this, but this is the download for the XCPNG Center 742.9 binary release. All you have to do is extract it and run it. It doesn't currently have an installer, or at least the version I downloaded right now. They're working on that, but you just install it and then run the create a shortcut, which I'll just show you real quick on the desktop here, to the XCPNG Center. When you open it up, you're presented with this. Now I have my two other servers disconnected. You can have multiple servers. This is what allows things like ZenMotion to be able to pass a machine between the different servers by connecting them all together. So we'll go ahead and type in IP address. Three dot seventy seven. Type in our password, and now it's connected. Now, if I were to connect the other ones, it would pull together all the storage and everything else to allow you to pass between there. But that's why we're leaving these ones disconnected. Go ahead and make it full screen. Move myself out of the way here. So from here we can see that XCPNG, here's the what they refer to as DOM0 using a certain amount of memory, the control domain, the rest is all free of our 16 gigs, which there's no virtual machines on there. Here's our storage, which we have the removable storage, which is for plugging in USB drives and doing backups. Here's the local storage. Now, this is something about the way the local storage works. So we're gonna go ahead and look at that. 234 gigs total. So it's a 300 gig drive, and that's because part of it was used for the OS install. The rest was sliced up for storage. So as you can see, it doesn't take much. I believe that's roughly 50 or 60 gigs is gonna be allocated towards uh, the server itself. So you can run it, it does do the partitioning. You know, a handy thing to load this is either a fast drive or an SSD, and then you can add other drives as your storage pools. So here's all the disks that are in here, which are none. These are all the virtual disks that are available. And I'll just connect this one real quick to show you. When you look at the same thing on there, storage, you can see the different virtual disks on there. Go ahead and disconnect this one again. So in order to get started with loading VMs, we're gonna have to add some ISOs to this that we can boot off of. So we're gonna go ahead and go to new storage because if we start right with new VM, I'll just show you real quick. You can choose all these, but if we don't have an ISO to load it, well, that's gonna be difficult then. So we're gonna start with a, start with new storage. We're gonna start with, you can do NFS ISO or Windows file sharing. So you could share the ISOs from your Windows computer. And we'll just call this, you know, ISO library, next. Where does it go? You can do username and password here. I actually have an ISO library on FreeNAS, but like I said, this could be a Windows share. So also it's slash slash 192.168.3.4 slash ISO. I'm just copy and paste it here. You can see it working in Windows. Creating storage repository. And here are all those ISOs I have in here. I have a PFSense, I have Debian, I have an old version of Debian there. It really doesn't matter, whichever one you want to load. Here's a uh, Clonezilla's in here, lots of other different things I've been playing with. Uh, CentOS, even FreeNAS, even though it's a 11.4 ISO. All you have to do is drop anything in the shared ISO library and then you can build a virtual machine with it. So let's go ahead and create a new VM. So there's a wide variety of templates. These kind of get you a base for it. You can just say other miscellaneous if you didn't want to choose any of the templates. We're going to go ahead and choose the Debian one here, but we do have lots of Windows, Windows servers, and no worries if you have something newer than what's even listed in here or even legacy stuff. You can customize the settings. These are just general templates. So we'll go ahead and choose Debian 9.
install from ISO. Now this is where you can just choose the list of ISOs that are in here. So we'll go ahead and choose this Debian 9.1. I know it's older, but I don't feel like stopping to go download a new version. Another option is though, without if you didn't use an ISO library, but you do have boot from network setup, that is completely possible to do that. Next, place it on this VM server. Now, if I had these other ones attached, the list would come up for all the different servers that we had. CPU and memory. Now, this is interesting because I know there's not that many virtual CPUs available in this system. It will let you over allocate. Don't do that because you'll have lots of problems. So we're just gonna go ahead and give it two cores. Now you can choose if it's two sockets, one core, or one socket with two cores. That's a personal preference. And there may be reasons uh, go be, going beyond the scope of this, you want to set it up a very specific way, but it does give you the option of whether or not you want one physical CPU is how it's presented to the underlying OS, or do you want two physical CPUs or multiple going from there? For example, if we said we have a 16, do you want 16 sockets, eight sockets, or two sockets with eight cores? So just a couple different options in there. And it does give you a warning when you want to see how many virtual versus physical. So I've gone over the number of cores and it says it only has eight physical CPUs or eight cores in the terms of what we use. So you don't want to over allocate, you will get a warning. So we're going to go back to our original idea of two and one socket with two cores per socket. Memory, let's give it a little more RAM than this. And these can be adjusted later. Let's give it a gig of RAM. Next. There's no GPUs in this. Uh, this does have certain GPUs. Go ahead and look up the compatibility list are supported and can be used in there. Storage, let's edit this. By default, it wants to use local storage. Now, if we had multiple storages attached, you could choose that. For example, I have iSCSI set up on my other ones and it will choose the combination of storage. If you have multiple hard drives, you can choose all the different hard drives or different storage locations you have set up for this. We're gonna go ahead and edit this because 10 gigs is not enough and we'll go ahead and make it 100 gigs. Then we'll go next. Networking. Now we didn't do anything to the networking. There's only one network. So it's gonna auto generate attached to network zero. And I'm actually gonna show you how we can play around with that. Start VM automatically, create now. And now it's created. There it is. They show up in the list here. We go over here to the console and it's on the graphical install. So we'll go ahead and run through the install. And you can see it's pretty straightforward. So while it's doing this and it's gonna pull networking information, I'm gonna show you how the networking works in here. So we're gonna go here and we're gonna look at the network. So it only has one network card. So this becomes very, very simple to do. Here at the bottom, and we're gonna to go to configure, this is the management interface. And it's attached to, well, the only network available on there. But if you had multiple network cards, this is where you could do things like attach a management interface there. And this is the interface that we connected to 192.163.77. This is also where I can statically assign and push the settings back over to our server. And if we had more network interfaces, we could add more IP addresses and tie more things to this. You can't mess with the management one while it's in use. If you wanna use other things like an iSCSI network and things like that, you're gonna need a different network card because it dedicates that one towards storage. Now, the ones dedicated towards storage means they can't have management on it and storage at the same time, but it does allow those storage networks to be attached to the VMs. So the bottom side of this essentially is your management interface network for the system. These are networks available at the top here that are for the VMs themselves. Let's go take a look at where this is at. Say yes, and the VM is just loading right away. Back over here to the system, to the networking. Now this is where the networking works as well for extended network, bonded network, single server private network, and external network. Single server private will do first LAN of Zen server. And what I did here, as you may notice, 
Please note the link status of none, active, and the NIC it's tied to. There is no NIC, just like this one. They're actually the same type of network. What these do is these create networks that are not tied to anything. So we're going to have properties. They only exist on this server. So if I connect two machines and they both connect to this network, they can talk to each other, but they don't go outside the system. So picture an interface that is, so to speak, internally facing into the system, but has no options outside there. It can't escape. This is great for specialized network testing, maybe even some uh, pen testing or virus testing. You can assign this. I use this for PFSense uh, testing. An example would be I have the LAN side of PFSense facing this internally created NIC. Then I put all the other virtual machines on that same NIC. And then they all can talk to each other and are behind there without any public interfaces that can leave the machine. And then you can create your virtualized network. So PFSense can act as a virtualized firewall. And I've done this for a lot of testing. Automatically add this network to new virtual machines. That's the box that you see right here, the auto. And what that means is every time you add a virtual machine, it just defaults to adding it. And you can add a list of network adapters. This helps when you're trying to add a lot of virtual machines. Now, other networks we can add are like the external network. We'll call it VLAN. And if you have a network that is VLAN aware, and have proper smart switches configured, you can choose the VLAN ID and I'll attach it to this NIC. So NIC zero would be a trunk port with all the VLANs pushed to it. And then you can say this specifically, this network interface only pulls VLAN 50 off of that trunk port. And that is actually how our system is set up and VLAN 50 is valid. So now any virtual machines I attach to this become trunked to this one here. Now. Like I said, it, I've had a few people tell me they don't support VLANs. It absolutely is supported. And then you can go back into, actually, we'll go ahead and uh, continue. We'll go ahead and let this go. And go to your networking, add interface. And here's those interfaces, LAN of Zen, Network Zero, or VLAN. And we can add them multiple interfaces. Or you can do properties on the existing one. I can't do it while the machine's running unless it has a Zen server tools loaded and switch them. When a server is running and it has Zen server tools, this actually allows you to go ahead and change out the network interface while the machine is live. And it works the same as unplugging, unplugging a network cable. The machine doesn't lose the adapter. It just swaps out the status of where it's connected to when you swap it out, which is really handy. So this is going through and loading. Now, a couple things you can do right here is we can set this to scale. So it will scale with the size of the window. You can undock it so it becomes its own window. We're going to go ahead and redock it. I can do full screen if I wanted. I can send the alt control delete to this console here. Now, once it's got the Zen server tools loaded, this becomes not grayed out where it says open SSH console. That's where you can go in and SSH in. Or if it's a Windows machine, it will open an RDP console there. So that's another option. So say no to this. Now up here is the, we don't want the desktop environment. We'll load an SSH server. And you can see this is going for being an older i7. This is installing quite fast and it's pulling the ISO from across the network. So it doesn't really affect performance that much, booting ISOs across the network on there. And having a network share with all your ISOs just becomes really convenient, especially if you're sharing it from a Windows machine, your home machine, because you're getting started with this. And then all the ISOs automatically just show up here in this pull down. So I can actually pull out the disk, which is a bad idea while it's installing, but that's where you can just hit eject and control that. Now here's where we can edit the memory. Here's where you see the storage for the virtual machine. Here's where you get all your performance statistics of what the virtual machine is doing. And this can all be customized. You can hit new graph, choose, you know, vCPU, uh, concurrency, network receive. If you have multiple disks, it allows you to see all the multiple disks in here and get down to the detail. There's only a couple CPUs, or you can edit existing ones. So edit graph, and we'll put average CPU on here. You can also do things like tie together the network speeds at the same time into one graph. So you can consolidate these if you want, but by default, it creates these couple of them here and they're separated. Now, memory data, it has no memory data on the virtual machine until you load the Zen server tools.
and we'll cover real quick how to load them. Continue. Choose the drive to load Grub on. Installation complete. Finishing installation and rebooting. And we're at the command line. Now this is fully working and ready to go. It's got there, let's see if we can ping something. Yep, we've got network access. So now we have a fully running VM of Debian on here. Now let's talk about loading the tools. Down here at the bottom, XCPNG tools. So it says guesttools.iso. We're gonna go ahead and insert that. You can change DVDs while the system's running. You don't have to reboot it for that. It's just like popping a CD-ROM in. Now this is gonna vary by different Linux distributions, but we're gonna go ahead and mount dev CD-ROM to media CD-ROM, mounted read only, media CD-ROM. Now obviously if this is Windows, this is easy. There's a setup.exe file that you can run, but we're gonna go into the Linux directory and there is an install.sh. So we're gonna go ahead and run this installer. It figures out which one, what things I need. We're gonna say yes. And now I should reboot this virtual machine to have the utilities running. No, I just showed there was no, as soon as you start the utilities, it immediately will start showing the memory usage, but we're gonna go ahead and like it says reboot. So it has all the utilities loaded and the services loaded. Now it's not absolutely imperative you load the utilities, but they do help a lot. They help with the, uh, when you're doing snapshots of the virtual machines or any of the tuning, like the memory, right here's the memory usage. And let's go over here now. It actually allows us things like changing the memory on the fly, automatically allocate memory within this range, and you can set a range of memory. So you can dynamically allocate it and free up memory for other services. Obviously over allocation of memory is a problem, but if you have machines that you know will dynamically expand and contract, this is an option and it allows the system to do this because of the Zen server tools being loaded. This also helps with things like snapshots. So if we take a snapshot here, And we now have a snapshot of this virtual machine. Here's where it is, here's where it is now. That helps with this because now it actually took kind of like the open file problem you have if you wanna back up a machine. It gets behind the scenes when it has the Zen server tools and allows that type of snapshot to be created. Now from here, so let's go ahead and show the system. We rebooted it. So we took the snapshot before I created this file test. Let's show you how you can revert a snapshot. So here's where it's at. Here's where the system is now. Here's where it was. Now, if you don't like this view, you can simply go to a list view. And we're gonna go ahead and take another snapshot. The test file. Take snapshot. So now we can view it this way, or we can go back to the tree view and see the different places that the system is. So now we can go ahead and revert to this one, just to show you how this works. Do we wanna take a snapshot of before? When you're doing a lot of testing, this is really handy. We're not gonna bother doing it, but now we're gonna revert the VM, which is gonna force it to reboot. So back here, look at our snapshots. And now we have forked it. And now we can continue on. So once it boots here, we'll go look and we'll see that that file I created test is not there. No test file. But what if we wanted that one back? Well, this one right here is after test. So now we can actually say, we can even export this as an entire VM. We can also say new VM from snapshot. Next, next. 
You can literally just say next and yes to all this. It's going to default to everything else. Now, this is important here. If it's going on the same storage pool, use storage level fast disk clone. The reason that's important, what it's going to do is create a VM based on that snapshot, but it's going to have a base of the other VM. If you ever move this to another machine, it automatically takes care of the separation. But what this is allowing us to do, and there's our other one here, it created it that fast on this old i7 machine. When we look at the storage available on here, uh, local storage, we're not using all of the storage. So here's those snapshots. And so far, we're only using 3.8 gig of 234 right here. Now, this is what's interesting about the thin provisioning. The 3.8 gigs is because each one of these machines, even though I gave them larger hard drives, are thin provisioned on this particular machine right here. And this one is a fork, so to speak, based on the other one. So you can see when we go back here after the test file, it gives it the name. So now this one has there, and there's no snapshots on this file. Here's the console for this because it's a clone. And there's that test file I created. So we forked it and moved it over. But what if, you know, because this is based off the other one, what happens if I move it to another machine? No problem, we'll go ahead and connect to another machine real quick. If we wanted to move it, we can just say migrate and it would migrate over. Uh, because these are machines are not the same, this is running a different platform than this one, I can't do the uh, forced live migration. I would have to do a shutdown migration. But at that point, it would allow me to separate and move them to another machine. Go ahead and disconnect this one again. So now you've seen how to create the snapshots, move the snapshots, fork them, and start another virtual machine. This allows you to do a lot of fun playing with the machines because then you can keep reverting them back as many times as you want. And especially when you're learning, this is hugely important, especially you want to back things up or move them around. And speaking of backing up, let's talk about how that works real quick. So if you wanted to back up one of these virtual machines, revert to snapshot, export to file, you can literally click on this and export an XVA file. Save it to the desktop. And it exports XVA, so we're going to hit Save. OK, I do not have enough storage there, so I have to save it somewhere else. So let me go ahead and hit Export to File. I believe I have a map network drive. I do. There we go. And we're going to go down here to Notifications, Events, and you'll see it exporting. This keeps track of all the events and uh, things that are happening in the system. It's going to create this XVA file. Now, once you have an XVA file, that is very easy. And I have a few videos that cover this. You can even do these from the command line. You can just type, you know, XE import and pull in an XVA file, export an XVA file. Those are a complete copy of your virtual machine. Uh, there are tools you can use like XCPNG the, um, to do this, or you can use Zen Orchestra to import and export entire XVA files. That is the standard format by which this works for entire virtual machines. So if you want to just back up your virtual machine, this is easy way to do it. And there's import as well. So if you go to import It supports XVA and your standard OVA, OVF files, so your open virtualization format. Um, oddly, it does not export to standard virtualization format, but it does import from them. So if you were using VirtualBox before switching to XCPNG, you can import those. Also, a lot of places provide virtual machines ready to go. I've had no problem importing these using the XCP Zen Center directly in. It will take and ask a few questions. It may not have exactly the same format that was used to create the OVF files, but if they were ex exported from VirtualBox, it imports them perfectly fine. Please note, sometimes you do have to change network settings on there, but there are a, always little tricks to doing that because if the same network adapter isn't emulated, you may have to make some adjustments accordingly. Now, once you're at this top level right here, now that we have a few things running, we're looking at this server. You can see here is each of the machines that are virtual machines running. 
how the memory is allocated. We can look at the storage status, the networking status, the actual NICs. Now, this is an important thing. This is networking as of how you're configuring the networks. This is where the NICs are. So this is the part where we can go ahead and there's not much really here because there's no bonds or anything else. This is where you can create a bonded network, uh, which is tying a few of them together for more speed. And that includes 10 gigabits. So if you have some 10 gigabit cards in here, you can actually tie a few of them together to get 20 gigabits or however many you have in there. If there was any GPUs, and like I said, you can look up compatibility. This is where you'd get to that. This is the same console that you see on the system. So it actually gives us shell access right here and we can type access console. And it's the same console we've seen running before where it's just got the status and everything else. You can easily get to this local command shell reboot shut down, show running VMs, show the disk storage repository. Here's a voice from scene, VMs running on this host. Escape, escape, we'll get back out of this. Now SSH is enabled, so you can SSH into this machine as well. Back to our performance graph. Users. Now I have not done this, and maybe one day I'll do a video on it. This actually has the ability to set up XCPNG with domain authentication. Um, not something I've used. Citrix charges extra for that as a license. But it's built in here. And like I said, right here is the general settings, so you can see all the version details, which license you're on, and processors in there. And like I said, this is the Core i7 at eight, uh, Model 870 at 2.93 gigahertz. So this kind of gives you an idea how to get started with Zen Server, how to get playing with it. It's not too difficult of a system to use. And it's really slick, especially once you start having a lot of virtual machines or several servers connected and you want to orchestrate everything around. It's pretty fun to play with. And once you have them all connected, you can use this. And we're going to go here to the top level now. And you can see things across all the virtual machines. You can create searches, VMs, snapshots, VMs by network. This helps you manage things at scale. So one of my friends had uh, used this for a hosting company where they think they had a few thousand servers, and this allows you to quickly allocate and move those around. And you can also look for different things. So we're on infrastructure. We can look at objects. And what this is doing is pooling everything together because they're all joined. I can see all the different storages. I can see all the different templates that are in here, custom templates. If you had some custom setups, you can do. And this helps for quick deployment. You can create a series of templates uh, to help you deploy something. So once you have something set up, if you're doing an orchestration of scale, you can go through and create a template that automatically has everything how you want it done. And uh, an example that's going to be when you're over here, and we'll go back to infrastructure. We'll go to like this, uh, this one here as a snapshot. Save as a template. You can create that template so you have it pre-configured and you know every virtual machine you want deployed like that. You can build it as a template so you can quickly deploy it. Now, the last thing I said I'd cover is how to load Zen Orchestra on here. And there's two ways to do that. So Zen Orchestra does ask for your email address. If you are uncomfortable with that, feel free to use one of the many free email services and let them go there. They do ask that you register. So you can download free here and it has an XVA file. Now, like I had said, the XVA files, you can actually use them from the command line. So what this actually does here, bash-c curl-s http xoa.io slash deploy, it's going to download and run from the command line the actual XVA file right into the system and stream it in. So this is the script in case you want to know what it looks like. This is the XVA deploy that actually runs from right here. Let's go ahead and just run it from the command line. Copy. We're going to SSH into the server. I know you shouldn't run things from the command line that you copy and paste off of things, especially as root, but you know, this is a YouTube demo. Run at your own risk. Welcome to the XOA auto deploy script. So IP address, DHCP, sure. Importing XOA VM, that was it. 
there's not another command that you have to run to make that work. So here is running through the export now. Let's get this out of the way behind us. And let's go back over to the system. And here it is. Now, the yellow means it's on its way. So we can go over here to notifications. Actually, it's probably already done. It's doing the import from the command line, so it's not in the notifications. But it's downloading and setting this up. And we'll just wait a few minutes, and it'll be ready. All right, and that's it. So now the uh, Zen server is ready, and we can just go to this IP address. We're going to copy the link. And this is in there. It's uh, admin at admin.net and admin password. So my bad. Net. Don't leave that at default. <laughs> uh, now we're going to go ahead and hit add server. root fancy password which in case you didn't know by the typing it's one two three four five six you do have to check unauthorized certificates and hit connect and that's it now we can actually go to the dashboard and there's those db and youtube vms and we're in here now i've done a few videos already on zen orchestra this is the basic free version that does not have all of the features. Now, the giving you the email address for the download, if you notice, I didn't have to give an email address, but that also means I don't get to just do the in-place upgrades with this. So if I want to do the in-place upgrades, I have to do that. I have to do that. And I've done a video on the difference between Zen Orchestra Free and Zen Orchestra, the one you build yourself. It is open source, but if they build it for you, they have a fee for it. If you build it yourself and support it yourself and inside your own VM, you can. But that's all you have to do to get started. And now you're running with Zen Server. So hopefully this is a good guide to get you started with this and playing with it. And you can watch all my other videos and this serves as a base. I will do a separate video on how to connect this to a free NAS with iSCSI because that's kind of an ideal way. And something more enterprise you're going to see is with your storage server connected to your virtualization server. And that's not just for Zen. This is something you're going to see in both Zen Server and in VMware, a lot of other commercial systems do that. You have your server separate. So that'll be a separate video and um, look for that coming in the next week or so. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback. Or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.